All right. So, thank so you was so that much. the saddest ending to a talk you ever saw? <laughs> Where we mostly plant based promoting talk. Yes, that was uh, that was uh, um, not. But but it's a but it's a valid point. It's just one other aspect of the uh, of consuming animals is that you're consuming their their hormonal makeup while they are being prepared, if you will, murdered um, for, uh, you know, for for market. So just another reason not to do it. So with that, let's uh, open it up to questions. If uh, anybody has a question, they can go ahead and raise their hand in Zoom. Uh, I think you have a limited amount of time left. Is that correct, doctor? Oh, my gosh. I see. Yeah. So I've got about uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll try to, uh, to keep it brief. So, um, so real quickly, so yesterday, uh, so you referenced, um, Dr. Baxter Montgomery, um, and one of his, uh, bits of research yesterday, he was on one of the panels along with Dr. Nathan Bryan. Now, Na Dr. Nathan Bryan, um, it was talking about cholesterol and how, um, having higher cholesterol could be better. And Dr. Baxter Montgomery agreed with him that insofar, like we have this obsession with lower cholesterol. That's, that's what I've always seen going uh -huh. back to T. Con Campbell um, and, and Esselstyn talking about, uh, about lower cholesterol being much better. Um, and the, the talk was that if your cholesterol is high, but you're doing everything right, it might just be that your body just needs to produce more cholesterol. So if you're not consuming animal products, for example, uh, and you have a high cholesterol, like above 200, you know, or 240 even, that that's not a problem. What are your What are your thoughts on that? So, well, but I have to I always give the disclaimer. I don't have many thoughts. I, I just read. Okay, <laughs> what, what what have you read? <laughs> what does the literature say? Is that um, this is a really uh, important principle that everyone needs to know? Is that there is no good level of LDL cholesterol. I actually used to, uh, uh, took it out of my, this talk, but, um, just remember that there are mammals like the New Zealand white rabbit that has an LDL of about 10 and it's perfectly normal, neurologically develops normal babies, the fastest growing neural neurologic system, uh, and has have an LDL cholesterol of about 11 or 15. And so Everything that's in the bloodstream is extra. People don't need it uh, to, for cell repair or the brain or spinal cord or all the things you would think that cholesterol is good for. And so we continue to find, I know that we keep setting a level and then moving the bar. It used to be that you wanted your LDL less than 100, then it was 90, then it was 70. The more recent one is 55. Uh, from the European Society of Cardiology. But if you look carefully at the data, and anyone can put this in a search engine, LDL, excuse me, LDL and cardiac events, just put those two things in, hit images, and you'll see a graph with a line drawn between the number of events and the LDL cholesterol. And the fact is that 20 is better than 30, and 30 is better than 40, and 40 is better than our target of 55. So you know, it, it, there, it may get to a point where it's low enough that you're kind of protected in general, but lower is always going to be better. Now, again, I'm talking about LDL cholesterol. Mm. Uh, there's also the LP little a issue. There's also ApoB. There's um, small dense LDL and there's inflammation. So anything that we say about cholesterol in general really kind of has to be taken uh, with, I started to say it's a grain of salt, but low sodium in our new diet, right? And so a cholesterol of 240, a total cholesterol of 240, you think would be extremely unhealthy? I doesn't, it depends on what it is. So probably unhealthy. And that's because of the big surprise that happened two years ago. That is, we used to say, oh, 240 is fine if you have a, if you're one of those people gifted with a high HDL. Okay. Well, it turns out a high HDL increases heart attacks. We had that wrong for 60 years. And so if anybody looks that one up, you'll see Can Hart and Copenhagen trials showing that there's a U-shaped relationship between uh, heart attack and death and HDL level. There's sort of a, a, a good zone about 50 to 80 or so, but people with the really high ones, 
it goes up and we were right about the other side, low HDL puts you at risk as well. So, so, so 240 is probably never good, but no, we mostly, uh, the management that we need to do is about the LDL. So if I could get people to stop talking about all the other ones, just talk about your LDL and get it down as low as possible. Great. Thank you. And give me one second here. I somehow adjusted my screen so small that I can't even read it. So bear with me here. Um, just give me one second here. So uh, with, with regard to uh, with blood tests, um, what should people get tested in, uh, you know, for if they're going to get a blood test, what should they be looking for? Can you hear me? Oh, you're you're muted. Oh, no, OK, now you're unmuted. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank yeah, you. Um, so um, I'm sorry. So <laughs> I was trying to get your attention. So I'm sorry. So what's the question? Uh, so so what are the essential uh, medical tests that that? everyone should consider getting uh, irregularly to ensure optimal health and early oh. detection of potential health issues. Yeah, I don't think there are any. If everyone's doing a whole food plant-based diet and they're not having any symptoms, there may not be any tests that you need. Now, having said that, please download uh, the ASCVD risk calculator, which actually got updated three months ago to the prevent calculator. And the prevent calculator is actually really important. Um, it removed race from your cardiovascular risk estimate, and it added social determinants of health represented by your zip code, and it added kidney function. So anyone who's had their, their routine chemistries done can actually get on the uh, American Heart Association prevent calculator website and come up with your risk. Now, if that 10-year risk is 5 to 7.5, this is a little bit of a long answer, 5 to 7.5, 10-year risk of having heart attack, stroke, and death, then you really should have further testing. That is your um, uh, small, dense LDL, your C-reactive protein, maybe your TMAO levels, um, looking for your APOB levels. You need to and find out if you had a, a positive family history or an inflammatory disease um, that elevates your C-reactive protein like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, all of which are associated with more heart attacks. So there are about 14 things on that list, including chronic kidney disease, that actually can uh, raise your risk so that you should be tested. The usual test then would be a coronary calcium score. Everyone who has a 7.5% up to 20% should get a calcium score. Now, the guidelines say above 20%, you just need therapy. You don't, well, uh, I think most of us who were on that guideline committee four years later are thinking, you know what? That coronary calcium score, it's a CT scan, very inexpensive, very quick, very low radiation, tell you whether or not if you're, uh, you know, above age 40, whether or not you have any plaque in your coronary arteries, that changes things. If it's zero, just do a whole food plant-based diet. You're like cardiac immortal for at least a decade. Do a whole food plant-based diet and exercise program. If it's low, that is a score of one to 100, then you really should be on cholesterol-lowering methodologies. That would include uh, typically a statin. There are non-statin therapies for the people who are statin intolerant, but getting that LDL down to less than 55 is important. If it's above 100, then you probably are going to that substantial amount of coronary disease. And you should be thinking about having a statin or cholesterol lowering plus an antiplatelet drug. We used to use aspirin all the time. Everybody heard of aspirin. Aspirin's dangerous. And the more recent data, <clears throat> Panther trial and every subsequent trial says that that old drug that we used to use for stents, uh, Plavix or clopidogrel is the, is the drug name, is so much safer than aspirin, not only is it safer, but it prevents more events. Um, so most of it, we're trying to move away from aspirin and move toward clopidogrel. It's a little more expensive, not that much more expensive. If your score is more than 300 though, then you probably start thinking that this might be in the realm of, should I get as a person with no symptoms? Because we don't do screening people on symptomatic people, you know, screening tests on symptomatic people, we do real testing. Um, but might consider, having um, 
a stress test or some kind of, or a CT angiogram or some test to make sure that that amount of plaque isn't obstructing coronary arteries. You're not one of those people who has so-called silent heart disease um, that can result in sudden death. So that CT scan is very powerful because it's going to give you one of four different answers and uh, tell you what the next move should be. And with regard to the calcium score, can you ever lower your calcium score or once you have a certain calcium score, that's it? Please don't lower the calcium score. So it turns out that calcium paradoxically is actually the healed plaque. And so the reason that a higher score is higher risk is only because of the non-calcified plaque that's next to the calcified plaque. That calcified plaque is never going to do anything to you. And so um, good treatment raises your calcium score. Good statin therapy, lowering your LDL, getting the fatty plaque to become fibrotic or, or kind of like scar tissue and then calcify increases your calcium score. Now, it just turns out that bad blood pressure, bad cholesterol, that also increases your calcium score, score but it's increasing your calcium score with non-calcified plaque as well, which you really don't want. All right now, the, so the the concern, and I'm the reason I'm glad you brought this up, is um, that there are people going out on a limb and doing K2 or NATO uh, to try to get the calcium out of their arteries, and people have done um, chelation therapy. It's kind of counterintuitive to do that. Now I welcome randomized trials. The the um, uh, the chelation therapy did do randomized trials, and they did show that there was no benefit, a slight signal in the second trial that it improved outcomes in diabetics, but there was no definitive signal, no benefit, uh, and that and that's important. So the NATO people really should do a randomized trial uh, to sh make sure that decalcifying your plaque isn't making it the inflamed ugly, purulent material that you've been trying to get rid of by calcifying it. Okay, great. And uh, we're just about done. How would people um, follow you, get in touch with you, uh, check out your work? Do you have uh, so I'm apparently Google famous. So if you do, it's easy to find me uh, on Google. And so just uh, type in my name, Kim Williams, MD. You'll see a couple pictures of the brain surgeon. That's my son. Uh, but the rest is mostly me. All right, great. So um, with that, I thank you. And if we could unmute the audience so they can show their appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.